Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and thanks for coming along. Um, today, I'd like to talk to you about a topic that I've been doing plenty of thinking about over the last 50 years, but that's uh, solar photovoltaics and the role that it's going to play in our energy future. So um, I'm based at the University of New South Wales in Sydney and shown on the slide at the bottom there is a si iconic Sydney Opera House and then our labs at the university, solar powered of course, and then the, the final shop there is of our uh, solar industrial research facility where we do a lot of uh, technolog technological transfer to industry and uh, you'll see that we've had quite strong interaction with industry in our work. So there's three um, major topics I want to touch upon today. So hopefully there'll be something of interest to everyone. Um, first of all, the technology that goes into the cells and how that's been improving and what holds the future holds. Costs, which have been really important, as you'll see. And then the, the role that uh, solar, I think, is destined to play in climate change mitigation. So first, technology. So uh, the solar cell is very much a technology of the 20th century. Uh, so it all started with Albert Einstein and his realisation that light, which had previously been shown to be a wave, when it interacted with matter, it could be regarded as taking the, the form of particles, now called photons. And uh, so, you know, the sun's shooting photons at you and the solar cell essentially converts each photon that helps, that hits it, that has enough energy into an electron, which then constitutes an electrical current in the cell. So the, um, the graph in the upper um, portion there just sort of shows the number of photons of different energy that are coming. So the energy of each photon is really quite small, but there's literally zillions of them um, striking the Earth every second. So the, the energy is measured in a quantity called electron volts, a very small unit of energy, but it's, it really gives you a good feel for what happens in photovoltaics because you um, create electrical current, each photon gets converted to an electron, each photon that has enough energy. But the, um, from energy conservation, it means that the um, energy of that uh, electron can never exceed a voltage, it can never be supplied at a voltage greater than the EV rating of the photon. So you can see the, the ratings one or two electron volts and that means these solar cells can never generate more than that just from energy conservation. There's plenty of photons hitting the cells and that creates large numbers of electrons so large currents are produced but small voltages and the energy from the cell is a product of the two. Uh, you know, most of the photons lie in the visible spectrum, as you can see there, which um, may not be an accident. Um, this, is, this is a solar cell um, that was typical of what was being used when I joined the field now 50 years ago. But um, the, the photons enter the, the material made, um, well, I, I should have said that the realisation that light was, came as little particles that Einstein made then led to the development of quantum mechanics that led to the understanding of material properties much more intimately than had been known previously, including the properties of materials known as semiconductors. And silicon is the most common semiconductor used commercially now. And the solar cells are largely made from silicon, although other material choices are possible, as we'll see. So um, if the photon enters a semiconductor like silicon, if it's got enough energy, it'll excite an electron in the atomic bonds in the silicon up to an excited state where the electrons can move through the material. So that, um, um, that's good. Um, but it leaves behind a vacant state where the electron previously was. And not only can the electron move through the material, but that vacant state can essentially move by a nearby electron in a similar state hopping into it. So you get the motion of electrons in these vacant states which act very much like a positive charge. So you sort of have two charge carriers within the material. The vacant state acts much like a bubble. You know, it's not really a bubble that's moving, it's water moving into where the bubble used to be. Similarly for these uh, holes. Uh, if you just had the semiconductor sitting there and these electrons and holes would be created and then they'd eventually relax back and you'd go back to the original situation. For a solar cell, you've got to get the electrons moving off in one direction and the holes moving off in the other. And you do that by incorporating impurities into the silicon. And that 
changes the properties. One type of impurity will make it easy for electrons to go through it, and another type of impurity will make it easy for the holes to go through it. So you have a junction between these two different types of um, materials. And uh, on this diagram here, the light blue region at the top, easy for electrons to go through. The uh, darker green, greenish material, easy for holes to go through. So you get the electrons preferentially going upwards and the holes going downwards. And um, if you connect an electrical load between the top and the rear of the cell, you'll get a current flowing through it. So ideally, each photon that's absorbed will give you one electron flowing through that load. And as I said before, the maximum voltage that can be generated across that load is related to the uh, energy of the lowest energy photon that the cell can respond to. So something around one volt is the type of voltage. So a little bit like a, you know, AAA battery or something or other, you get, you know, about a volt out output and a current that depends upon the area of the cell. Uh, the, the cells are made from silicon. The silicon is really thin, like about a sixth of a millimetre thick is the typical thickness. So a millimetre is not all that thick. And then a sixth of that is what you're dealing with with these cells. And uh, because the voltage is so low, you generally connect them in series to build the voltage up to a, to a reasonable value. Um, and uh, because the silicon is so thin, the material, the cells themselves are quite brittle. If I passed one around the audience here, it probably wouldn't come back to me in one piece. But <laughs> dozens of little pieces of silicon. Um, so you've got to provide encapsulation of it. So encapsulate in, in what's called a module with a glass cover sheet, which provides mo much of the mechanical strength that's needed, and an aluminium frame that reinforces that uh, glass sheet mechanically. And then you need to provide chemical protection of the cell because there's metal parts and so on connecting the cells together. You, you know, best to keep moisture away from them, that I guess would be very well known here in Singapore. You can get corrosion occurring from you know, moist ambience, so you try and keep water vapour out, out of the module. And then, um, so the chemical protection that packaging provides, and also electrical protection, because when you connect thousands of these cells together, you can generate thousands of volts in voltage, and um, you don't want to be, uh, be exposed to that, you don't want to touch that. So a mechanical, chemical and um, electrical protection providing those modules. So um, this is an evolution of modules over the last six or seven years, well, a little bit longer. Um, you can notice a couple of changes. One obvious one is they're getting bigger. Um, and the cells in older modules used to be square, as shown uh, in the module on the left there. And um, now they're rectangular. And that's to do with the current that's generated. So the, the square ones got as big as they could and still without developing excess current. So they were generating about 10 amps of current. And uh, handling more than 10 amps, you need a lot of conductor, copper conductor and so on. So they stayed at that size for a long time. And then someone realised it was quite simple to cut them in half and, and uh, cut down the current that way. And uh, so um, they've recently changed to rectangular shape and the size of the wafers that have used have grown accordingly. So the, the, um, the starting material starts off square, but larger area than previously. The other thing that's happened, the, the module on the far right there, um, it's actually shown from the front and the back. So now the cells are what's called bifacial. They'll respond to light from both directions. So you might wonder what the use of that is, but a lot of stray light gets to the rear of the module and that's just a way of boosting the output of the module essentially for free. So you can see they're quite um, tall. They're, they're now eight foot or 2.4 metres in height is a typical type of, well, a height for a, a modern module. And the energy conversion efficiency has increased. So 16% was typical of 2015, and now module efficiency is up to 24% is available commercially. We'll talk a little bit about efficiency during the talk. So one of those big modules there, under bright sunshine, it'll generate just about exactly one horsepower. So you can, it's pretty much the same length as a horse, that 2.4 metre, eight foot, but got about the same surface area, but it's 20 or 30 times lighter. So you try and keep the module under about 40 kilos so you can, two people can comfortably carry it around all day. Um, 
as might befit the fact that I think, you know, as I'll explain later, I think solar is going to play a major role in climate change mitigation. The first efficient cell made front page news on the New York Times. So this was back in um, April of 1954. So there's a little story there about um, fast power of sun is tapped by battery using sand ingredient. And there was a lot of hope, as you can see up in the, uh, the sketch in the upper right, you know, there, there may be ways families could use this new technology, do wonderful things with it. But the, te the cells then were just far too expensive to have any hope of doing that. And what's happened since, as we'll see, is the costs have come right down. But back then, just hopelessly expensive. But fortunately, um, a role was found uh, almost immediately in satellites. So the fourth satellite that went up had solar cells on them, and they worked very well. And so when communication sta satellites started to be introduced in the 1960s, that was a natural um, uh, way of generating electricity that re required for those communication satellites. So the solar cells, a solar cell industry was established providing these very expensive cells for a spacecraft. And uh, that provided a, a, you know, a body of expertise that proved very important in the subsequent development of the cells for terrestrial applications. So uh, the chart up, uh, in the middle bottom section there just shows how the efficiency of the cells improved with time. So. Um, uh, a lot of the early work was done at Bell Labs, that you might have deduced from some of the earlier slides. Um, but the first cells were 1% efficient, then in 1954 got up to 4%, then 6%. And um, then in the development for the space programs, the uh, efficiency kept going upwards and upwards, up to about 15% efficient. And uh, just when I joined the field in the early 70s, there were two further developments that... Um, one was including those pyramids you can see on the top surface. They're very much the same geometry as those at Giza, but uh, millions of times smaller, of course. Um, but they're formed by intersecting crystal planes within the silicon material. So the, um, the silicon material, if you orientate it the right way and etch it, you can get these planes exposed when they start blocking the etching of the material, and you end up with these pyramids, which help re reduce reflection because light hitting them gets reflected downwards, so you have two, two chances of getting uh, coupled in. And the other thing you might notice is this uh, P plus layer at the back, and that's just where you've added extra impurity of the type that blocks electrons, and that just makes it even harder for electrons to go in the wrong direction. So that was another improvement that was made about the same time, which gave a big jump in efficiency. And um, at the same time, um, another innovation introduced was screen printing of the, the metal contacts to the cell. The way you uh, often print uh, patterns on T-shirts and things, just having a, a, a screen with a pattern in it and just um, wipe a, a fluid over it. In this case, the fluid contains medical par metal particles that you then, after you've got the pattern you want on the cell, you then heat and end up with solid metal contacts. So that's a very low-cost way of uh, applying the metal. So that field, that cell was known as the aluminium back surface field cell because the impurity introduced was aluminium at the back to give that P plus layer. Um, and it became very important, like it used the very best technology that was available at that time and very low cost because of this screen printing approach, so the fabrication cost were low. And, um, it was so successful, it remained the dominant commercial technology for the next 40 years. So a very successful uh, technology. <coughs> Meanwhile, I'd just finished my PhD and joined UNSW, and this is me with my first PhD student early in my career. Hair was a little bit blacker and longer in those days. Um, but, and, uh, you know, our lab, we were just starting off from scratch, so we didn't have much equipment or anything. But very fortunately, the topic I'd been working on for my uh, PhD uh, proved to be, to be very um, timely um, in that NASA had started a program to try and improve silicon solar cell performance by increasing the output voltage. Like I said, the, you know, the output is limited by the uh, energy of the photon that the cell can absorb, the, the, the minimum energy of the photons absorbed. Um, but you don't get that in an actual cell, you only get a fraction of that, and try and increase that fraction 
was what uh, NASA funded a big program um, to try and get improvement in the in the efficiency of the cell. But fortunately, what I've been working on my um, PhD was a, another way of getting that selectivity, getting the electrons going in the right direction, but instead of adding impurities to the silicon, just adding surface layers, a thin tunneling oxide layer, and then the metal contact gave you the same type of directionality that, um, that introducing impurities did. But um, it, it was really very timely in that it's very easy to make cells and measure their voltage output. Um, and um, NASA started this program with all their contractors competing with each other to get improved voltages using various tricks and whatever. But with this um, sort of different approach to the whole thing, using this tunneling type of structure, we got way ahead of them. And that sort of got our group to international attention and around, allowed me to get funding to increase the group and get better equipment and so on. And eventually NASA funded us as part of the program as well. And we pushed the voltage from, you know, somewhere around uh, 600 millivolts, you know, 0.6 of a volt was typical for commercial devices, right up to uh, 700 millivolts. So that's a 16%, um, you know, relative improvement, which you can translate ideally into efficiency. Along the way, we, um, the, the, the um, oxide layers and these structures were very thin because electrons could move through them by quantum mechanical tunneling effects, so they have to be very thin for that to occur. And the metals that you we were using were quite reactive, so if you heated these cells up to a reasonable temperature, the metal would react with the oxide and oxide would quickly disappear, getting attacked by the metal. Uh, but we came up with this other way of getting around that, and that was by replacing the metal by a heavily doped layer of silicon, which acts, you know, like a, like a metal, but it's a lot more, um, lot well, it doesn't react with the, the silicon oxide. So um, that structure there gave us, you know, reasonable voltages, um, as shown on the chart there. Um, and that's really important because that's one of the technologies that's used commercially nowadays as well. So uh, having this voltage lead, you know, we then sort of decided, and, and getting some increased funding as a result of the international tension that lead was um, attracting, we just we um, put a lot of effort in to try to convert those high voltages to improved energy conversion efficiency. So in 1983, we got our first world record for silicon cell performance, and uh, that was with the cell structure shown there using tunneling this tunneling oxide approach, and that's the small group team members who um, who were involved in that effort. And um, uh, several of them went on to play a major role in the development of the industry, as we'll see. So um, uh, uh, eventually we were able to improve the efficiency of the cell, the best confirmed efficiency by over 50% in relative terms after all this developmental work that had already occurred in the space program. So it wasn't uh, sort of an immature technology. And uh, we held the record for silicon cell efficiency for three decades. So. <laughs> Very proud of that achievement, obviously. All the previous records had been uh, achieved in the US space program, largely. Um, the other thing we realised was there was another way of, um, of getting this um, selectivity and the high voltages that resulted from it, which was a little bit simpler. It was just making the contacts to the cell very small, so a sort of simpler type of approach, and it was simpler to produce the structures as well. So the same year, we got our second world record using this small area contact approach. And that, um, at the same time, I've realized that applying that to the rear of the cell would give additional advantages. And that's the origin of the PERC solar cell that was mentioned in the introduction, which has dominated the recent um, market for solar cells. Uh, but the first um, device incorporating the underlying concepts was made back in 1983, although the full structure with the rear on, we didn't make efficient devices till 1988, and that carried us right through to 25% uh, efficiency later on. So this is a team that um, was largely involved in the developing of that PERC technology. So this, this is a photo was taken when we got our first 20% efficient cell, which was like the four minute mile of photovoltaics that had long been regarded as a you know, practical limit on what you could do with silicon cells. So we 
we sort of sailed through that limit and then we um, pushed on towards uh, higher values. So in 85, there was a certain gender imbalance in the group, but that was rapidly reinforced by the three then young ladies that joined us to um, um, help develop the PERC technology. So two of those went on to have a big role in the establishment of the Chinese industry, uh, acting as uh, some of the CTOs of the early companies in mainland China that um, pushed the uh, industry along, as we'll see. So what's happened since then? Um, we we uh, got the efficiency to 25% using the PERC structure, um, but since then it's been pushed up to, just before Christmas, a group in China got 27% efficiency. There's a fundamental limit on the efficiency of 29% uh, for a silicon cell, and uh, you can see we're getting quite close to that efficiency limit now. So. Um, the different structures that have been developed to improve the efficiency, I won't go into the gory details of them all, but there's four of them that are competing for market share. So PERC has been the dominant one of late, and it, it relies on these small area contacts largely to, to get the high voltages that, um, that these structures can demonstrate. And then the second one is now known as TOPCON, tunneling oxide passivated contact. And it uses this tunneling approach that we demonstrated back in 83 to get the high voltage output. And it's um, uh, doing slightly better than PERC now, as we'll see. Then there's a heterojunction approach, which is like a low temperature version of that tunneling oxide approach. So you put down layers at low temperature, but again, a very thin layer is used between heavily doped, uh, high, between layers with high impurity content. And that's known as the heterojunction cell. And then uh, the final structure is in fact the oldest of all these and it uses a structure where both contacts are applied to the rear so that you don't have the contacts on the front. The contacts on the front obviously block some of the light. So that's a good way of going if you're after really high efficiency. Now that's called the interdig interdigitated back contact cell. And it's the one that recently established the 27% efficiency and set all the, all the recent uh, records uh, after our record got surpassed. But if you look at what happened in market share, so these bars here just show the 100% of the market. So you can see in 12, 2012, largely dominated by the blue and maroon regions, which was that structure that was developed in 1984 and 5, that um, aluminium back surface field structure, and um, it dominated right through to 2015, so it was 40 years after it was first demonstrated, it was still the dominant technology. And then you can see the brown and yellow regions coming in. That's the PERC structure starting to take over market share. And very quickly it went from just about zero to um, close to 100% of market share. I think 91.2% was the official figure for 2021, slightly less in 2022. Um, but that very rapid turnover is a result of the industry growing very quickly. So the industry is doubling every three years or so. So if all the manufacturers are installing all their new production lines to accommodate that growth in the industry with the latest technology, you know, it only takes about three years to go from nothing to 50% to of the market. And that's what this graph here is showing. Uh, the interesting thing is that orange region uh, at the top there is still quite small in 2022, but this year it's grown a lot. And that's that second technology, the Topcon technology. So the feeling is that it'll take over from PERC, probably in the same type of time scale that PERC took over from um, the aluminium back surface field. So both of those technologies are ones uh, originating in our lab. But, uh, you know, we're getting quite close to that 29% efficiency. And I think in production, the manufacturers will, will get very close to that. But, how, you know, what happens then? Can you get any better? And um, you can. You know, the cell, as I said before, is essentially a photon converter. So it doesn't matter if, you, if a blue photon or a red photon hits it, you get pretty much the same output, you know, one electron in the external circuit. However, um, you know, the, the voltage output of a silicon cell is limited to one volt, but if you designed a cell that could convert the blue photons with, you know, three volt, electron volt energy, you could get much higher voltage from it, you know, if it, if it could only convert the three EV and higher energy photons. So this gives the idea of stacking cells from different materials on top of one another. 
So the one that can convert the high energy photons is on top. So it might convert, you know, any photon of above two electron volt energy gets converted in that cell and that gives a, it a higher output than you'd get if you converted those same photons in a silicon cell. And then for photons that have less energy, they're not absorbed in that cell, they just pass through to the next cell in the stack. And it converts the photons that um, you know, have the right energy for it, and then the remaining photons pass through to the bottom cell. So you don't really waste photons, but for each photon absorbed, you get a higher average voltage output, so you can improve the efficiency. So this, this is the way I think the technology's got to go to get to higher and higher efficiency. And the gains that you can get, you can see on the chart on the right there, the green just shows the limit with, if you stick to silicon uh, as the bottom cell, um, as I said before, the efficiency limit for it is 29%. But if you could have any ideal material, you know, the, your, your dream material, you could get 33%. But if you stack a cell onto silicon, Efficiency goes up for 42.5%. That's the limiting limit on the efficiency. Um, but it gets even closer to your dream material combination. As you can see in the chart there, the green is getting closer to the red bar. And even stacking two cells onto silicon starts falling behind a little bit, but it's still, still um, you know, very close to the optimum choice. The, the real challenge is just finding a material to stack onto silicon that has all silicon's desirable properties. So silicon's are very abundant. It's the second most abundant element in the earth crust after oxygen. So, you know, you need to be abundant on the scale that we're going to see photovoltaics installed over coming decades. You need plenty of the source material. It's non-toxic, which is also a good idea if you're going to be deploying thousands of square kilometres of these cells. It's stable, which is really very important. The silicon modules are warranted between 25 and 40 years with less than 20% degradation. So that's the type of stability we're talking about. And they're efficient, so I've shown several technologies competing with efficiencies above 25%, so efficient. Uh, you need something greater than 20%. The list there just shows all the candidate materials that are being looked at to stack onto silicon and perovskite is the favourite, and I know there's some good work being done here on perovskites. So it ticks two of the bo boxes. It, um, it, well, it can involve abundant materials, and it certainly can get efficiencies over 20%, up to 26% now. Uh, but it involves lead as one of its key constituents, which doesn't get a tick in the toxicity box. Um, and stability is the real challenge. So getting the same type of stability as you get from silicon is still a way off, I believe. And then there's a range of other technology, organics. Um, efficiency of organic solar cells have been improving very rapidly, so getting close to 20%. So it'll, um, it'll have three ticks soon. Uh, the only issue, I think, will be stability um, of, of the organics. And then there's all these other materials that I describe as artificial silicon. By combining elements in the periodic table in the right proportion, you can get the same average valency as, as silicon has of four, and that gives you a material with very similar properties to silicon, but ideally with a different um, energy response threshold to photons. So um, they're all being explored. The main problem with those has been the efficiency that you've been able to get. They haven't. Um, they haven't been able to get above 20% efficiency in low cost uh, con um, configurations. Also, many of them involve materials like uh, indium and gallium, selenium that are scarce, or arsenic uh, that's toxic, or cadmium to toxic. So, you know, you don't get uh, four ticks with any of them at the moment. So that's, that's the major research challenge, I think, facing photovoltaics. So make the perovskite stable or um, find another material that ticks those four boxes. Um, as you stack more cells, on, cells onto silicon, the, the cells at the top are stealing the photons before silicon gets a chance to convert them. So um, the output power from the silicon goes down consequently. So the more cells you stack, the less contribution you get to the output from the silicon cell. So it becomes less essential. So stacking onto silicon is a really good idea because the industries, you know, the present industry can make that transition and you can take advantage of the, the huge market and um, 
turnover of these large uh, manufacturers that presently dominate the industry. Uh, but by that time, there will be um, large quantities of these stack cells deployed in the field, so a lot of confidence will have been gained in the, in the cell complementary cell materials that are stacked onto the silicon. So you then might ask, you know, why would the silicon be necessary after that? So I think we'll see a transition somewhere down the track to an all sort of thin film cell uh, stack that doesn't rely on silicon wafers, but the thin layers are just deposited onto glass or some other supporting material. Uh, so that's my prediction for the evolution of the industry. And that features the technology bit of the talk, and I'll now talk about the costs, which has probably been the most important thing, so I've been more involved in the technological development, but uh, had some impact upon costs, as you'll see as well. So this was a chart that was published a few years back just showing all the studies that have been done of costs and prices of photovoltaics. And uh, you know, there hasn't been a big difference between the cost and the price uh, because it's been a low profit margin industry you know, for most of its history. But this shows you know, four decades of history of cost and prices. So you can see for a large part of that history, you could describe the cost reduction by a straight line on this semi-logarithmic uh, graph. So that means uh, exponential decreasing function. So the, the cost decreased at a compounded rate of 7% a year. If they had to continue doing that, they would have been $1 a watt for a module such as uh, shown up there. So those modules shown there are like that uh, 2015 one I showed earlier. They're about um, square cells. They're about um, 300 watts rating. So that would have cost uh, $300 for one of those modules. But there's something dramatic happening about 2008 that you can see from that slide there. And actually in um, 2020, those modules were selling for 20 cents a watt. So they'd be $60 rather than 300. So, um, you know, something quite dramatic happened. And this is the young uh, researcher responsible for that, uh, Dr. Zheng Rong Shi, my 12th PhD student, who's, a, who's an Australian citizen, but born in China and had this desire to set up manufacturing and thought China would be a good location to do that since uh, back in, uh, before the turn of the century, there was no commercial manufacturing of cells occurring in China. So he um, approached me with the idea of manufacturing in China and I said, you know how difficult that's gonna be because there's no infrastructure there and so on. But he was determined to, to do so. And um, set up his first manufacturing line in uh, 2002, it produced its first cells, and uh, I didn't realise I didn't realise how an important event this would be. But this was the establishment of the first commercial cell manufacturing in China, and I did some of the heavy lifting, helping cut the ribbon for the opening ceremony and so on. And some of my other students and uh, staff, you know, joined Zheng Rong as as co-founders of this startup and uh, others worked for him part-time in various positions. So we had a big role in the, the establishment of the company and, um, and possibly in its success. So uh, at the same time, German started, Germany started a feed-in tariff program, which was really very important for the development of both the solar and the wind industry. It just um, subsidised the... Well, it paid for the energy generated from solar and wind systems at a price that you... Um, at a price that's consistent with the cost of generating it, which then was a higher, was above the market value. So you could go to a bank and get a loan for a solar system because the, the output of it would be paid at a rate that could cover your loan repayments, essentially. So a really good scheme, and Zhengrong was able to tap into that scheme and sell his product in Germany, which uh, the German schemes provide a rapidly growing market for both wind and solar. Um, he was doing so well that his progress got noted by some US investment banks, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley in particular. And um, Chinese stocks were very popular on the US markets in this era because China was developing very quickly and uh, the US investors could see this huge markets you know, opening up very quickly. Um, so um, they encouraged him to do a management buyout, buy out his original Chinese investors and um, list on the New York Stock Exchange, which he did in 2005. And that was a huge success. It was the biggest technology float of the year. Um, 
raising 400 million for a small portion of the company was up on offer. It was the top technical listing of that year, so made more money than any other technology float of that year. It made Zhang Rong the first solar billionaire because he still owned the majority of the company after the listing. And uh, Goldman Sachs, one of the investment banks involved, I went through their figures and they made at least 200 million on the whole deal. So they were very pleased with what happened. So that created an avalanche of listings on, on US stock exchanges as investment banks look for other Chinese companies to repeat that listing success with and uh, Chinese companies that were trying to get into photovoltaic, photovoltaics were only too pleased to get the windfall cash injection that, that was implied from a successful listing. So the next five companies listing are shown there and um, many people from our group got grabbed and uh, got in um, senior positions within these companies because that was part of the due diligence of the investment banks was to show contact to good technology. So the chart at the upper right just sort of shows the money that was pumped into manufacturing in China between 2005 and 2012, I think it is there, most, most in the um, early phases. So over 7 billion was raised, pumped into the industry. Zheng Rong started his first company with a $6 million investment, so 7 billion is just um, you know, like three orders of magnitude more. So that allowed the industry to grow very rapidly in China and these companies had to compete against each other for market share. Um, and, and most of them were successful. So looking at the 2021 ranking of manufacturers, six of the top 10 were part of this listing frenzy between 2005 and 10 and benefited from the initial huge US cash injection. Um, but these companies had to uh, sell product to survive and that caused that first downward trend in the dark blue regions you can see there. That's these companies battled, battling to sell enough product to pay for their costs. And the, the six that were successful were able to lower their costs quickly enough that they survived this shakeout where uh, companies were competing for uh, market share. Um, and then um, entered a more stable stage. I've divided the chart into five different regions that I've got a short story for that I'll quickly go over. I've got about 10 minutes left, so I'll just whiz through this. Um, so Europe provided much of the early market for these companies through the German feed-in tariff scheme and similar schemes that were started, but less successful schemes that were started in Italy and Spain. So that provided the early market for these companies to allow them to grow. And then uh, the Europeans got sick of um, these, supporting these schemes when the, all the sales were going to Chinese companies. So the Chinese government stepped in and started taking over market development responsibility, particularly for its, its own countries, companies. So you can see uh, in this chart on the upper right, just showing the growth in the solar market, which as I mentioned before, growing very rapidly like the, the annual sales of cells doubles every three years approximately. And the red region shows the Chinese share of that market. So you can see, you know, it accounts for a large fraction of that market since about 2012 or so. It's been the largest uh, share of the, um, of the market for the cells. And that third region is just downward. Uh, prices going downwards as manufacturers were able to scale up their manufacturing capacity particularly Chinese manufacturers, to feed the growing market. The uh, fourth region there is, is the result of technology challenge. So this was when Perk started competing with that uh, more established technology. And uh, prior to then, in that region three, there'd been a steady 12% a year, you know, um, compounded decrease in the module average selling price. And um, then when that Perk started grabbing market share, there was a competition for market share between technologies. And um, the only way for the, the established technology to maintain its share was to reduce prices and it caused an acceleration in prices to reductions to above 20% a year, which is really very dramatic cost reductions occurring in that region. And um, by then, the module prices were getting very low, like as I said before, reached below 20 cents a watt in, in 2020. 
And uh, the International Energy Agency, which bills itself as the world authority on energy, started noticing what was happening with photovoltaics. It had previously been quite sceptical, as many people still are, about the role of renewables in our energy future. But then in 2020, they realised that the cost reductions were real and permanent and uh, started uh, uh, changing from a fairly um, uh, passive attitude to renewables to being a promoter of solar and wind as the most important technologies for us to be investing in. So um, in 2020, in its uh, World Outlook report, said solar is the new king of energy markets, now the cheapest source of electricity in most countries, now offers some of the lowest cost electricity ever seen in history. And other people uh, noticed these cost reductions as well and got even more excited. Um, this is a phrase I like, solar, solar's future is insanely cheap. And uh, Ramaz Nam coined that phrase in 2020. And the carbon track of the sky is the limit. Solar and wind energy potential is 100 times as much as the present global energy demand. So no resource restrictions. This insanely cheap electricity <laughs> in, um, available in huge quantities. And uh, the charts at the right there just sort of show the cost projections for solar and wind. Already, you know, lowest cost electricity in history in 2020, but uh, even lower potential uh, further down the track, with solar in particular having the potential to dip to really low levels. Okay, uh, the fifth region, we had three years of disruption due to COVID and um, a few other uh, mis perhaps at some of the manufacturing facilities, but we're back on track now on this downward trajectory as the red line there shows. After three years where there was no price reduction, things are back on track. So just to finish up, uh, just talk about solar's role in climate change mitigation. So as I said, the International Energy Agency was quite pessimistic, but in their uh, net zero uh, report for 2050, they, their pathway calls for the, the rapid scaling up of wind and solar this decade. And the chart on the right just sort of shows their uh, ideal project, projections for solar uptake. So there's two types of quantities that are mentioned there. One is the accumulated capacity that is plotted there. So we surpassed one terawatt in 2022 and um, they were calling for five terawatts to be installed by 2030, so a five times expansion in the capacity. The other thing that I've already talked about is the annual installation, and that corresponds to the slope here. So the IEA um, uh, projected that 630 gigawatts would be the type of capacity we need to be installing around 2030, and um, then you can see the slope diminishes, so they're not expecting the market to grow much after that, which is a little bit hard to understand why you'd have that expectation. But those in the industry have had um, more optimistic and um, monumental <laughs> projections, as shown in this graph, uh, it was published in Science uh, last year. But the blue curve there shows the actual cumulative capacity of solar installed, surpassing one terawatt in 2022. This is a semi-logarithmic graph, you might notice. And then the yellow or orange line shows the annual installations, which um, were 250 or something uh, gigawatts, the highest point shown there. But uh, this year it'll be above 400 gigawatts of solar installed. So following that dotted trajectory there, or probably a little bit ahead of it um, in where that's progressing but levelling out at about three terawatts of solar production per year, um, up from uh, 400 gigawatts. So going up by a factor of seven, you know, over the next 10 years, I guess it is. And the, this is the IEA projection by comparison. However, the IEA has been really conservative in its prior projections, so they've always um, expected that the solar market would flatten out 
like the next year after the present one. And this is just history of their projections. All those black lines are projections made in different years. And the actual market just kept going up, whereas they were expecting it to saturate every single year. So a little bit hard to understand how they had come to that conclusion and, and not realise something's a little bit weird about their projections. But, you know, that's the reality of what they have published. So even though they're being very supportive of renewables, they're still underestimating the potential in the view of many of us in the industry. Uh, similarly, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change hasn't uh, been too enthusiastic about renewables in its um, scenarios, which is a little bit unusual. But they published a report in 2022 just looking at what we could be doing now to reduce carbon emissions by 2030. And the chart on the right, which I, I realise the printing will be too small to read, it just sort of shows all the options they explored. And the blue regions are the good regions because they're the changes you can make that will have zero or negative costs associated with them. So they should be the no-brainer ones. They're the ones that you can do and save money. Uh, and you'll see there's some uh, just below halfway down. There's a lot of blue ones there. That's to do with transport. So more efficient vehicles and electric vehicles and all that kind of thing. They see a lot of potential there. But the really big ones are the two at the top that I've shown blown up. Hopefully enough that you can read the entries there. But the ones with the biggest blue regions were wind and solar energy. So, you know, that concurs with the IEA calling for a rapid uptake of those technologies. Um, and this chart here, the one on the right, just sort of shows the impact of one terawatt a year installation of solar. The one at the lower left just shows annual installations up to 2022 and then a projection for the following years, getting up to one terawatt about 2028. But in 2023, we actually skipped a year. There will probably be at least 419 um, gigawatts of solar installed rather than 335, so skipped a year, so everything might be brought forward a year or so. So we're going to get up to one terawatt sometime this decade. And the chart on the right just sort of shows the impact of installing one terawatt a year, year after year, if you're displacing coal from electricity generation, which is one of the easiest ones, one of the easiest um, applications for solar to, to make progress in, or oil from transport, which means electric vehicles and that kind of thing. So if you can um, install one terawatt a year or three terawatts a year, it'd be even better. You can see that it's putting you on the right kind of trajectory to keep um, uh, climate change under some type of control. Two, this is a two degree pathway shown there. Um, this is what our solar future might look like. In this projection here, 70% of the world's electricity is generated from solar and electricity becomes a more prominent energy source for the for the you know all energy supply and uh, the rest you know 18 percent from wind and uh, the rest from hydro um, and if we just look at these regions in the immediate vicinity um, are quite good for solar not so good for wind you know sort of only moderate winds in this area but um, one application that might be particularly relevant for Singapore and neighbors is floating solar. So there are already a couple of installations here on uh, inland waterways, you know, lakes and so on. Um, but um, the chart at the bottom just sort of shows best locations in the world for installing solar on the ocean, so in open water, you know, the offshore water. And uh, the grey regions there just show the paths of all the tropical storms that have occurred over the last 40 years. <laughs> but there's none around the equator. And that's because of the coral ice force. Um, you just don't get the tropical storms developing because there's not the driving force for their formation. So you've got this belt around the equator, which Singapore conveniently lies in. So those regions shown there in green and yellow are the best regions in the world for offshore floating solar. And um, this area is particularly good, largely because the wave heights uh, are lowest, lowest in the world in this region. So the red regions here are the regions that are lowest in the world for average wave height, well, m maximum wave height over the last 40 years. So very good offshore regions for installing solar, which, you know, obviously got a lot more space available there than uh, on land. So that's the end of the talk. So. Um, just a couple of points I wanted to make, you know, solar is cheap, but it's going to become cheaper. It's still on this downward trajectory, so insanely cheap we're going to see in the future. 
new technology accelerates the pace of change, so there's plenty in the wings, as I tried to show, and um, if we can get these tandem cells working, that'll provide another downward pressure on prices. Um, 10 seater watt modules, that sounds ridiculous, like um, you know, even 10 years ago, I wouldn't have believed that we'd be talking about 10 cent a watt module, but last week, the PERC modules, the average selling price was 10.7 cents a watt, so getting very close to that figure. And elect electricity costs of one cent a kilowatt hour, this is US dollars, um, I pay 35 cents a kilowatt hour in Sydney, so you know, one, one cent a kilowatt hour is insanely cheap. Um, there's been one system installed in Saudi Arabia where that was actually the contracted price paid to the installer. And um, solar is our best chance, I believe, of doing something sensible in mitigating um, global warming. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Green, for sharing your insights with us. Uh, may I invite you to take a seat for the Q&A segment. I would now like to invite Pro Assistant Professor Nripan Manus for the Q&A session. Hello, uh, that was an exciting talk. Um, I am very sure there will be questions from the audience. Um, could we get started? Yeah, right here oh. in the front. <clears throat> Maybe I can do this. Thank you, Martin. Great talk. Rick Parker, uh, Low Carbon Energy Research Program here in Singapore. Um, you painted quite a bright picture of Singapore for solar, but uh, the, the expectation of total available solar is only three plus gigawatts for the whole of Singapore, fairly limited, partly uh, accessible area available, maybe floating solar will unlock some of that. But uh, the other problems, as we just heard, are excessive rainfall, excessive uh, cloud cover, and again, as you referred to, a climate that's not conducive to, to long life of it may, may be good for long life of silicon, but the other metal parts tend to disappear long before the silicon. What, what do you think of the key technology trends that might unlock more of that uh, solar potential for Singapore? Yeah, yes, yeah, so, I yeah, like land availability is obviously an issue. Uh, I think the cloud coverage, you know, your annual solar um, insulation is still quite reasonable by world standards, although you know, lower than areas immediately to the north and south. But, um, you know, because of the, the clouds that stay around, I guess. But um, it's still qu quite reasonable by world standards, so I don't see that as a serious disadvantage. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of interest in exporting power from Australia up to Singapore via underwater cable. So, uh, and I, I understand there's been similar projects that have been suggested from Indonesia as well. So that might be one way of supplying it. Um, so floating solar is obviously, um, you know, of interest given your uniquely low um, maximum wave heights that you get in this area. So it makes it a lot less challenging than other areas for ocean deployment. So that might provide a real opportunity. And um, CERIS, the Solar Energy Research Institute of Singapore, has you know, really done you know, some of the world leading work in the area of floating solar. So it, it's something, it's an application that hasn't gone on unnoticed, a potential application here that hasn't gone unnoticed. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess that's the options. You, know, you, you um, can either import the solar-generated electricity from neighbours or, um, you know, uh, the floating solar might offer some potential. You know, like um, in Australia, most of the solar is rooftop-mounted in Australia on private homes. So, you know, here uh, it'd have to be on the top of high-rises, but... Um, you know, I've seen plenty of high-rises with fancy structure on the top, so I'm sure there's some way of doing fancy structures that integrated photovoltaics onto the top of these uh, high-rise buildings that seem to have, you know, most of them seem to have pretty pretty good sunlight access. They don't seem to be uh, shading each other too much. So, um, you know, so I think I think probably, you know, and there's, there's always talk about um, making windows that are semi-transparent, that are solar active. So that, that's certainly technically feasible, but it just hasn't been a successful market area up to now. But you can imagine all the high rises instead of tinted glass having solar active glass. Um, you know, I think the problem there is, you know, it's, 
hard, you, you want a standard size of glass, which is not going to go down well with architects. <laughs> so I think that's one of the real problems there. You, you know, for simplicity of electrical connection and everything, you want everything standardised. Um, yeah, so um, I, I, I think uh, that's the options that are available. Thanks, Martin. Uh, thanks for this wonderful and uh, like you are a great example of transferring the technology from the lab to the commercial scale. So when we are preparing for transferring any technology from lab to the commercialization, in what uh, para in sectors we need to prepare ourselves because instrumentation and everything will be different. So how to overcome those challenges? In, like, in what ways we can prepare all this? Yes, I, I, it was a little bit hard to hear the middle part of the question, but um, I, I guess our experience with technology transfer, when we started, we, we had the patents and we uh, got a company interested, actually BP Solar was the first big licensee we had. Uh, and we, we just thought, oh, we'll hand the patents over and explain what we did and give them all our published dec documentation and off they'd go with it and be a commercial product in a couple of years. Uh, but it, it took them a little bit longer to, to, to come to grips with the technology because they didn't really have the same expertise within their company that we had in the lab. So we realised that we probably have to go a little bit further in the lab with our technology transfer. So we, we believed going to the pilot line stage and setting up a, a, a process that could then be copied on a you know, bigger scale pilot line or something by the licensee was probably the best way of going. So, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, BP turned out to be one of our most successful licensees, but things probably would have gone a bit smoother if we had have gone a bit further in terms of developing the technology to a stage they could more easily take it over. Uh, I have one more short question. solar cells or any new development, how much is the difference I'm sorry, I didn't quite, did you hear that question? <laughs> I, think, uh, I think the question was when doing these technology translation, for example, the half-cut solar cells. Yes. Um, what is the role of simulation, or is it only actual experimental data that people believe? I guess. Yeah, no, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, yeah, so I, I think um, computer simulation is going to play a bigger and bigger role. So, um, yeah, it certainly has over my history of involvement with solar. Um, yeah, my uh, early career, I wrote some of the first programs for actually analysing a, a solar cell from the basic, you know, semiconductor equations. Uh, and that proved very useful because it gave me a sort of a unique insight into what was happening in the device and, re you know, relating it back to the simpler theories that you could deduce analytically was very useful um, in improving my understanding of cells and so on. But now, um, yeah, I, I think most processes, you know, involved in making the cells and, and in improving their performance would be as a result of simulation. So someone might have an idea and then the idea would get simulated and if it checked out the idea then you'd go into an experimental program to, to try and demonstrate it. But you probably wouldn't go straight in the experimental program without confirmation from simulation that, that it was um, viable. And, and I think, you know, like I see the big challenge as I mentioned is finding a material that you can stack onto silicon. So the, the ability of computer programs to simulate semiconductor properties from, you know, ab initio, just knowing the materials within the compound that you're interested in, uh, has improved greatly. And it's, it's now at the stage where it's certainly useful um, in that you can accurately predict crystal structure and if you know a few tricks, you can predict things like the photon response threshold, although it, it's not quite ab, ab initio yet. You have to sort of do a few tweaks and things to be able to do that. But I think eventually that will become much more powerful and accurate. And with the solar cell, with these thin films I was talking about stacking onto silicon, 
they would uh, probably be in polycrystalline form. So the grain boundaries between different crystals in those layers can be very active. And all the successful photovoltaic technologies uh, have found a way of um, neutralising that activity. So just a, a secret step that gets added that neutralises those grain boundaries. So the computer programs would have to work through all those options as well to be really useful down the track. But you know, maybe 10 years, I think, uh, be, we'll see really big improvements in that type of area. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, good afternoon, Professor Green. Um, Kevin Ko from the Material Science and Engineering School. Um, thank you for a very stimulating talk, uh, overview, a very fantastic overview of the whole uh, photovoltaic industry in which you've really played an incredible, significant role. Um, I have a climate change related question. Um, in one of your latest slides, you showed the gigatons of CO2 produced per year. And uh, your, the curve shows that it's, it should be reducing because of the great increase of uh, PV uh, being implemented globally. And um, I think um, I was just looking at the, your slide. It shows about uh, 35 gigatons of CO2 per year uh, is the peak uh, expected around 2018. Yeah. Um, my question is, because I've been monitoring the CO2 uh, uh, accretion rate in our atmosphere, and if you looked at the uh, Mauna Loa Observatory CO2 figures, uh, which was started in, uh, the monitoring started in 1958, it was 300 ppm in 1958. And today it's 420 ppm. And uh, what's scary is that the curve is still almost linear. Uh, you know, it's 100 ppm in 60 years. You know, of uh, uh, in 60 years. So your 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 prediction uh, is tells me it should be going down. Our accretion rate should be going down, but it's it's still you know linear. At, uh, 60, at 100 ppm over 60 years. So in, in, another, in another 60 years, we will hit 500 ppm of CO2, which means a hotter Earth. Um, how do you square these, you know, these two figures? Yeah, yeah, no, it's all a bit scary. But um, I, I didn't have time to spend, I could see I was running out of time, so I didn't have uh, as much time to spend on that slide as I normally would. But, it was a slide that um, um, was based on 2014 data, so it was published in 2015 by a carbon tracker. But the thing I really liked about it was it just showed how dramatic the situation really was in that if you remember back, back to that slide, the four biggest emitter, emitters were going to use the whole budget for a two degree temperature rise by 2030, That's right. even with their best efforts. So when I first saw that slide, uh, it was a little bit depressing <laughs> to be truthful. And, and as you say, um, you know, that slide was projecting by now we'd be on a downward slope, which we're, which we're not. Mm. So I think the only positive thing that has occurred in the intervening years has been a really strong reduction in the price of photovoltaics that has turned it from a possibility to a reality. And, you know, like, I think that's why it's going to be so important. Like, that's the only thing that I can see that has occurred that's really going to have an impact. And, um, you know, like um, last year, there was, you know, 258 gigawatts of photovoltaic installed. So, you know, that's a quarter of a terawatt. So, you'd, you know, you'd hardly see it on a graph like that. So you've got to get up to the terawatts and multi-terawatt quantities to really have an impact upon driving it down. So, and because... The turnover has been delayed, as you correctly noted. So it's, it's uh, you know, maybe the best thing can be said is it's sort of flattening out a bit now. Um, you know, it means it's even more important that we get up to that terawatt quickly and move on to two or three terawatts a year and find ways of um, using the, the cheap electricity from solar to, um, you know, replace fossil fuel consumption. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you all for the questions. Um, since we are running out of time, we have to move on. Uh, let us thank Professor Green again for the wonderful talk.